As in other Western European countries, uh, the Netherlands experienced from the beginning of uh, the century a seemingly sudden wave of, of public expressions of anti-Semitism. The decade of 2000-2010 is just marred by a number of headline-grabbing incidents involving mainly male youngsters in various social fields and institutions. Most attention is paid to disturbances of uh, the 4th uh, of May, World War II, remembrance of the dead, to the crowd chants and banners with abusive slogans and symbols at various demonstrations <coughs> against the policies of Israel, to the dissemination, especially via the internet, uh, of anti-Semitic comments, images, songs, rap songs, to the history, to the opposition to history lessons about uh, the Holocaust and secondary education, about which some teachers as whistleblowers began to uh, speak publicly only after, uh, uh, under the influence of uh, the more visible events, and finally to uh, the numerous so-called real-life incidents ranging from calling names to people to harassing them, uh, which in some instance uh, transferred into actual physical violence. Since then, either on the initiative of uh, local governments or private organizations, programs have been launched to, well, actually each of these domains to counter anti-Semitism, <coughs> or in any case to dampen the problem. How to account for this wave? All too soon, and for good reasons, um, these incidents were linked to the Moroccan background of the perpetrators. Although often born <coughs> in the Netherlands, they nevertheless were linguistically, socially, and culturally attached to the homeland of their parents. Moreover, or rather more precisely, it can be argued they themselves brought up their national identity, but not as a fact, but as a problem. They expressed their alienation in various ways, but also became the topic of a long debate up to the present day. And this was even being given new input after the statements of the politician Geert Wilders two years ago when he, at the political rally, uh, wished for fewer Moroccans. Um, at this time, a lawsuit is uh, brought up against him because of these statements. I have a few other slides. Of the protest that went on after the statements of Wilders. But here I shall be dealing with other controversial forms of uh, contentious political action. Apparently, by grappling with their ascribed, hyphenated Moroccan Dutch identity, the protesters and rebel rousers felt the need to evoke the stereotype of the Jew as well as insult threaten and mock real people. There's some evidence of anti-Semitic hate speech being distributed to leaflets, mosques, and protests prior to 2000. Actually, the Moroccan-born Mohamed Rabah, who was to become an MP for the Green Left Party, took it upon himself in 1993 to tape radio sessions on Moroccan migrant radio to cover the anti-Semitic speech of an imam, which was rather new at the time. And he and others began to notice the influence of Saudi-sponsored mosques. But besides this, there were the traditional forms, post-war forms of anti-Semitism, emanating from neo-Nazis, uh, which continued before and after the turn of the century. Still, the list of incidents and the context in which uh, they are to be understood is reason enough, I think, to look upon 2000 as a turning point, but not without some reservations. I would argue that the nature of uh, this post-2000 anti-Semitic wave requires a historical view. It calls for an understanding of the continu continuities and discontinuities in the social <coughs> and ideological makeup of the Moroccan Dutch community. That is, for the ways in which people who are included in this category have organized, expressed, and identified themselves over the years. This refers to the use of media, their ideological, ideological commitment, the form of organization, and their patterns of identification. Thus, we might grasp the significance of the past 15 years without losing sight of the heritage of the first generation. It may also give us the possibility to recognize the active role, agency, 
of people not solely as ascribed members of a social or cultural category, but as individuals with room to maneuver within the major processes we tend to determine. So based on these aspects, I'm going to briefly compare the first and second generation, focusing on the protest culture surrounding the Middle East conflict. And this compares as part of a large project based on a combination of historical uh, research, interviews, field work, which deals with some of the fields, mostly all of the fields I just mentioned. So, the prevailing image of the Dutch attitude towards Israel is that of a special relationship, mm -hmm. a relationship between two sworn friends. And uh, even if it's a correct image, uh, much has been written on it. It in any way changed in the crucial years of uh, the 60s, late 60s. So we can follow the changing approach to the conflict in the Middle East by looking at the momentum of June 67 and May 68. So in 67, the Netherlands was hit by a wave of solidarity with a supposedly threatened state. Hundreds of volunteers signed up to go to Israel and personally support the country. But it was also a moment when already existing critical voices came together, Jewish and non-Jewish. It was, it was as if Israel and the Palestinians were discovered, rediscovered, maybe. And the onset of diverse views led to fierce debates, like the one we see on the pictures, taken in the Anne Frank House. Um, just as the house was to be a location for debate, Anne Frank herself appeared for the first time on the scene as a symbol in pro-Palestinian media, never to disappear again. On the left, there's uh, Musa Suri, who was a Palestinian journalist, uh, working for the British Broadcast Service, but later on became uh, a journalist in the Netherlands, and his son is still an activist, pro-Palestinian activist. Uh, although not from the very beginning, in 1948, the social democratic left had been overwhelmingly pro-Israel in the 50s, but this began to change or diversify in the late 60s, and Zionism was fitted into a growing engagement with worldwide repression under the denominator of Verwilders, <coughs> Jane Dyson, we've heard before about this. The emergence of the new left and the generation of 68. The Dutch Palestine Committee, officially founded in 1969, emerged as an amalgam of various pro-Palestinian activists ranging from those who were familiar with the Middle East, a fair share of Catholic stakeholders, academics, majority linked to my, as it was once called, Catholic University in Nijmegen, students, and for instance, a prominent resistance hero who had organized the February strike in 41, who had received the honorary title of Righteous Among the Nations and, and the medal he returned demonstratively after the Six Day War. For some, the conflict was similar to Vietnam. For others, there seemed to be a special religious dimension associated with the conflict. But it was the anti-imperialist frame that came to the fore in protests. There also was a post-colonial dimension to the emergence of social movements and the resulting protests that deserves more attention, I think. In the 60s, Moroccans moved to Western Europe as post-colonial migrants and that experience was included in their collective actions. In 66, there were 5,000 Moroccans in the Netherlands. <coughs> in the early 70s, there were 70,000. And now the Bureau of Statistics classifies 380,000 people into the category of Morocco as country of origin. So there's no need to explain this first generation activism in an Orientalist way as a cultural oddity, an inherent Islamic threat, the Arab stage each have their own history, also with regard to the Holocaust in Israel. Morocco is quite different from Iran, for instance, which seems to act as the model Arab Islamic state in which many, in many accounts on Arab or Islamic anti-Semitism. Morocco, as you all know, was a colony during World War II. It had some camps, Jewish refugees, and furthermore, there was a complicated relationship with a large uh, Jewish community in Morocco. Abraham Serfati the Jewish non-Zionist uh, politician or activist was one of sort of symbolic leader of the, of the left, also for the Moroccan migrants in the Netherlands. 
So the main positions of the migrants I focus on can be traced back to a shared intellectual corpus of left-wing works, including those by Frans Fanon, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, the pol Moroccan politician Mehdi Ben Barka, and uh, already mentioned here Maxime Rodinson. The latter had published this influential article uh, about Israel's effect colonial in Le Temps Modern, the famous journal of Sartre and Lanzmann. And his articles read on both sides of the Mediterranean. So according to Rodinson, the conflict was not the outcome of a national emancipation struggle or fulfilled of religious promise, but legacy of colonial project. Um, and this fitted into an anti-imperialist atmosphere which had become en vogue worldwide. Actually, the very first documented Moroccan participation in public protest was when Rodinson and Nathan Weistock visited the student conference in the 70s, organized 1970, exactly 1970, which was organized by the later uh, then student uh, chair, but later on uh, chair of the Palestine Committee, was when the earlier mentioned Mohammed Rabah intervened publicly to criticize Rodinson's reluctance to act. So migrants and Dutch representatives of already existing left-wing activist movement joined forces against Israel as an imperialistic bridgehead of the West. And over the years, that usually went well, but occasionally partners in protest clashed. The slippery slope of anti-Semitism, as a minute keeper of the Dutch Palestine Committee once called it, was always lurking, but was also the ongoing threat at least in the eyes of the Palestine Committee, and that was already the case in 1969-1970, that others would play the anti-Semitism card to deflect legitimate criticism. One called Celebre, in this respect, was the distribution in 1981 by a local branch of the Palestine Committee of postcards which Israel was compared to Nazi Germany in some way. The drawings by the artist, uh, Syrian Palestinian artist Barun Kakutli, led to a criminal charge and a conviction, the only one for the Palestine Committee ever. Uh, and the case is still the subject of uh, debate among Jews, fierce debate. So the comparison Nazi Germany, uh, Israel, in various international and locally known top boy was much older, of course, than in 2000. There were already some hints in 48 in the Netherlands but really began in 67, to be found in Dutch as well as in Moroccan newspapers. When we look at the Dutch uh, Moroccan activism, uh, with the criteria I just mentioned, so uh, media use, ideology, organization, identification in mind, the picture looked like this. The Moroccan activists of the earliest hour all came from the same coastal region, Mohamedia, Genitra, Tanger, Lanrash, and they were not from the northern rural lift, where the majority of migrants came from, they came from a Moroccan culture in Sumis of urban resistance, state violence, and Zionism had become part of daily life in Moroccan society in the 60s. It was ingrained, at least, in every political ideology and belonged to the repertoire classique of culture of protest. And once in the Netherlands, these migrants continued on these shared understandings. They came to organize themselves in the command, the committee of Moroccan works in the Netherlands. First chair was Abdou Menehbi. Uh, who had been politically active in Morocco and in trade union as a youngster. And um, for instance, in the famous 65 protest. And when moving to Paris, he got involved in my organization, uh, Association de Travailleurs de Maghrebin en France, de France, founded by, again, Ma, uh, Mehdi uh, Ben Barka. And he participated in the organization of demonstrations around the Boulevard Barbès, as he told me. One of the insights of the earliest hour, Hadisha Ali, who was to become an MP, Social Democratic MP, and at present actually is chair of the Dutch Parliament, described Kwan as a very politicized organization with a small group of academic men at the core. And the academic uh, feature did not apply to uh, uh, Mehdi. And these men had ended up in the Netherlands via France. Uh, and in this male-dominated environment, as Ali put it, uh, she became active as a fierce participant of the ongoing discussion about the fight against capitalism and the oppression of women. <coughs> These men and women, women got their ideas from books and pamphlets and inside, inside organization trading, student organization, trade unionists, 
trade unions or migrant movement. Ali recollects how she was embarrassed and bought a stack of left-wing books, literature to prepare herself in this environment of jeans, long hair, and beards. So the command addressed the class struggle, organized protest against the Moroccan regime, supported third world thinking, and sympathized with the liberation struggle for the oppressed around the world. The imagined community was that of Morocco, but the guest workers had to compete with the right-wing royalists about what kind of Morocco should prevail. The organizational ideology was strictly secular and also focused on the labor and constitutional policies or the position of the guest workers. And it was from this ideology that the organization also participated in the commemoration of World War II, February strike as an anti-racist rally, for instance. And in 1980, Ben Nevi later read, along with the representative for Jewish and Israeli interest group, the CD, for the victims of the bombing in Paris, uh, Paris through Copernic. So we can see this. And actually, there's a swastika on the side, just a few hours before the commemoration started on the, near the, the monument for the February strike. A swastika was painted at the site by unknown perpetrators, and they had to clean it very quickly. The command joined forces with the Palestine Committee and other migrant organizations. In the Netherlands, they were capable of mobilizing a large part of the fellow migrants. Protest rallies came about through consultation and negotiation. So, for instance, the CD and the command, that is Rue Copernic Demo, agreed not to bring Palestinian scarves or Israeli flags. So, it was a sort of trade off. The command, furthermore, was regularly summoned to refrain from texts on banners that the Palestine Committee interpreted as hate speech. So, it was a kind of learning on the job. I have a few pictures. This uh, reference is actually, as far as I can tell, not Moroccan or Turkish. There is a Turkish uh, banner here, left wing, Turkish uh, organization, sort of counter organization of the Kumon, <coughs> or broader organization, let's say. Uh, so, also the organizational structure, as such, with Menebi, for instance, is a long time long-standing chair helped to dampen the anti-Zionist vocabulary. I'm not sure what I said. Yeah. So the, some, some of these uh, protests uh, combined uh, Jewish and non-Jewish uh, protests, uh, for instance, here at the Sabra Shatila demonstration. I think there's another one. No, now we get to. So the political activism of second generation migrants during the Palestinian Second Intifada of 2000 and afterwards is rooted in the activism of the first generation, even though mobilization strategies and the ideological commitment differ. A large coalition, and the first time things got out of hand, was in October 2000, when in the demonstrations, young Mohammed al dura became the symbol of Israeli violence. I've looked elsewhere into this al dura use uh, in more detail. For now, I confine myself to saying that as a signifier of the Middle East conflict, the death of Mohammed al Dura came to bridge the diverse ideological commitments and strategies of protest, ranging from old school secular left wing persuasions to new Islamic belief. So, this is from, still from a video, there's much more on this <coughs> relating to al Dura. From 2000 onwards, a new vocabulary emerges, as well as, well as another way of doing things. In a way, even though the command still operated in the early 2000s, as one of the main organizations for organizing protests, they were increasingly not reaching new followers. It seems as if the control mechanisms no longer were working, let alone were they capable of containing youngsters in other social domains. 30 Moroccan youth invoked Hitler on one of the canals of Amsterdam, it said in the newspaper with respect to the first 2000 demo. But the command responded with only adolescent, miscon adolescent misconduct. The lack of influence was confirmed, for instance, by another MP of Moroccan descent, Ahmed Markouche, 
who was born in Morocco, began as police officer to become spokesperson of the Moroccan mo mosques in the Netherlands, and now is an MP for the Social Democrats. And he was the one who came up with the idea of introducing decoy Jews to catch perpetrators on the streets of Amsterdam. He witnessed how the secular migrants did not have the vocabulary to reach out to the religious Moroccans, among which there were their own children, so to speak. For, so for several reasons, one may observe the diminishing authority of the first generation. These youngsters were mobilized through other means, as we all know. First and foremost, of course, through the first chat sites, websites, then through social media. But lacked a clear public uh, organization or, in some instances, created new ones. They might not have routine access to broadcast and print media, but they had slogans, banners, songs, videos, internet postings at their disposal to bring the message across. They were mobilized and introduced into new ideologies, first and foremost with the religious content. Some underwent conversion, others mainly turned from a Moroccan to a religious identity, becoming Muslims. Actually, the very first political act by people who called themselves Muslim was with the Russia affair in the Netherlands. Although we now tend to call everyone Muslim, this was never the case before the 1990s. Rabba and Nebi, for instance, still find it very strange to be called Muslim, as if their whole identity and worldview depends on their religious background. So in 2002, 2010, the clearest example, because it was also put on camera, of anti-Semitic hate speech was when a youngster was interviewed at, occasion, at the occasion of a BDS flash mob at the supermarket of the Palestine Committee, in which he most strikingly did not participate. But as a bystander, he explained his hate speech, explaining his solidarity with his Muslim brothers in Palestine. The Israeli Jews should be exterminated and so forth. He was convicted for this. This phrasing would have been out of the question by the left-wing activist, activist, nor did I find anything of this in the first intifada of 88 and so forth. A second clear example is uh, constituted by childhood friends Samir Rasus and Mohamed Bouyeri. The first was convicted for planning a uh, terrorist attack. They were both school friends. Actually, they went to the same school as my wife. Uh, the second for murdering film director and journalist Theo van Gogh, who both went through a quick conversion while simultaneously gaining interest in the Middle East conflict. Azuz uh, walked around with a fake explosive belt at the demonstration in 2002, of which the first picture was on Times Square. And he explained Aldura had been his call to act. Bouyeri only watched Belgian television on the conflict because of the bias on the Dutch television. Important in all this, and then I come to the end, was a growing generational gap. For instance, in new 2004, a new website, elkalem.nl, announced it would publish an anti-Jewish manifesto. As its founder, Mohammed Jabri, explained to me they had already published an anti-gay manifesto. Jabri received a Muslim education, reacted against it, but returned to Islam after a long quest. And shortly before the turn of the century, he became a practicing Muslim. He and his friends were fed up with the so-called migrant representatives such as Abu Talib, who is now the mayor of uh, Rotterdam, an errant boy of the establishment, a Moroccan house negro, and uh, with the subsidized migrant websites and organizations. <coughs> the same, of course, can be said of the original Belgian IAL, the Arab European League, who made the new generation independent, politically active, in opposition to the masquerade, as termed by its founder, Abu Jaja, of the established spokesperson of the immigrant community. The IAL published in 2006 two Holocaust cartoons in the Netherlands in response to Mohammed cartoons and in response with the Iranian cartoon contest. They were convicted for this as well. So prevalent in these years was a generation conflict and a crisis of authority. The new generation pushed aside any hint of being subservient. It argued for mobilization, activism, So Bouyeri, besides killing Van Gogh, wrote and distributed many uh, numerous, numerous papers, which I've uh, analyzed elsewhere. And in one of his first writings, Jihad in Amsterdam West, he had become a Muslim, but he had not yet become a, a terrorist. <laughs> he was still trying to work in his neighborhood. 
Bouillerie says that this generational gap was now so wide that parents and children were literally unable to understand each other. They could not longer communicate in the same language. And he proposed a step-by-step -step approach with an important role for local imams in order to reconcile the two generations. A year later, he already passed this point denouncing the imams as pillars of establishment. The letter left the body of Van Gogh was graphically anti-Semitic. So Appa, self-styled straat philosopher, street philosopher, revolutionary armed with a pen, rapper by profession, addressed the crowd at the rally at the occasion of Operation Consulate. Yet, although he was there, he pronounced, fuck the system, fuck demonstrations. In the 2014 summer of protests, this slogan had changed into fuck the Zionist, fuck the Talmud. Appa interpreted the mindset of a generation, so the first generation in one of his rap songs, had become stranded in a system that made a numb of the desired cake, they only got crumbs. The gen second generation fought against rage and impotence in hostile Netherlands. And as he said, who am I supposed to be, Dutch or Moroccan? I conclude, the conflict has remained in the forefront of Moroccan Dutch attention for years, decades, but more than ever, the stereotype of the Jew again got deployed in the politics of highly problemized national and ethnic identities. Whereas for the first uh, generation, the conflict was made, was located out the more or less clear cut national rock and Dutch identities, or even a way to, in, to, to integrate with Dutch political culture and memory culture, the conflict of 2000 entered into the Dutch struggle of uh, ethnic and national identities. So the imagined community no longer was with the either Moroccan or Dutch community, but for or an internationally uh, community of repressed uh, people, but as on a religious community worldwide. This increasingly clashed with the national ideology, religious uh, framework in the Netherlands, and the nationalist backlash in the Netherlands. Being largely unaware of real Jews, for, for, for most instances in the Netherlands, they apparently, this new generation, needed the Jew in all his different stereotypical manifestations to succeed, to succeed in relocating themselves in Holland or in the wider world. Sometimes Jews, in this case, the powerful Jews, tend to oppose to Muslims or Moroccans, whereas in other instances, the Jew functions as a kind of third party positioned in between the regular Dutch, whom they, are, whom they control the Jews, and the powerless Moroccan Dutch. I thank you.